And so anyway, it's always such an honor uh, to get to be the Destiny Church. I mean, uh, thank you for letting me come and thank you for your invitation. And uh, Y'all got the best pastors in the world. Y'all know that? Yeah. Uh, did, did you know that? Yeah. I'm you. We have wonderful leadership in this church. And uh, I, want us to, uh, I want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 36, okay, if you will. I want to read you a story that's actually quite, uh, quite sobering. Um, the, the setting is uh, under the reign of King Jehoiakim. Israel was under the reign of King Jehoiakim. And I'm going to be reading, starting in verse 21. And listen to this account. It's, uh, it's very somber. It says this, The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll. And Jehudai brought it from El Shammah's room and read it to the king as all his officials stood by. It was late autumn and the king was in a winterized part of the palace sitting in front of a fire to keep warm. Each time Jehudai finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire section by section until the whole scroll was burned up. Neither the king nor his attendants showed any signs of fear or repentance at what they heard. Skipping down to verse 27. After the king had burned the scroll on which Baruch had written Jeremiah's words, the Lord gave Jeremiah another message. He said, get another scroll and write everything again just as you did on the scroll King Jehoiakim burned. And then skipping down to verse 32. So Jeremiah took another scroll and dictated again to his secretary Baruch and he wrote everything that had been on the scroll King Jehoiakim had burned in the fire. Only this time he added much more. I want, to re I want to speak to you this morning on the thought, rewrite the scroll. Rewrite the scroll. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I want to thank you that your presence is already here. And Lord, I ask that you would one more time open up every heart, open up every mind, and open up every spirit. I ask God that you'd move there and out of the way one more time. Lord, you know how badly I need you this morning. And I am trusting you to speak this word through me once again. And I trust you for what you're going to do in this body today. Lord, your word tells us that day by day, you're transforming us into the image of your son. Yes. And that's my prayer this morning, that we're going to walk out of here just looking a little more like Jesus. Yes. God, with a little more fire in our soul. God, understanding, God, a little bit more what our true destiny is and what our, what our obligation is, Lord. And we thank you, God, that we get to do this. We thank you, Father, that we get to be a witness for you. We thank you for all you're about to do in Jesus' name. We pray, and everybody says together, "Amen." Amen. 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 Praise God. Uh, you know, the place is Jerusalem. Its spiritual and moral climate has rotted, and they are fast approaching God's 586 BC deadline when Babylon would invade and destroy and conquer Israel's capital. But it's right here, about 609 BC, in the middle of Jeremiah's 40-year ministry to a people that would not repent, that God decides to reach out to a wicked king named Jehoiakim and his whole administration. Because God reasoned in this same chapter, in verse 3, He said, Perhaps the people of Judah will repent when they hear again all the terrible things that I have planned for them. And then I will be able to forgive their sins and wrongdoings. And you know, when I read that, I'm always comforted to know that God's plan A is always redemption and right, repentance. Right, right. Yeah, thank God for that. Yeah. But as the message was being read, we shockingly watch as Jehoiakim yeah. cuts and burns the word of the Lord section by section, piece by piece, without any remorse or repentance. Fast forward to 1962. We watched our government cut away and burn officially sponsored prayer in public school. One year later in 1963, we cut away and burned official Bible reading in public school. Ten years later in 1973, we cut away and burned the sanctity of human life as Roe v. Wade became the law of the land so the Supreme Court uh, legalized abortion in our country. June the 26th, 2015, we're now guilty of cutting away and burning God's definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman. See, over the last 60 years, our country has taken its cultural knife and has sliced away God's laws and principles section by section, little by little, without seemingly any conscience or repentance. But here's what I see in this. The crisis that God's people faced then is the same crisis that we are facing right now. But in the same way, the answer to the challenge then 
He's the answer to the challenge now. You know, when the king burned the scroll and was getting rid of it section by section, piece by piece, I love what God tells Jeremiah. He doesn't tell him, well, Jeremiah, you tried. You did the best you could. It's time to just move on. No, he told him this. He said, Jeremiah, they may have burned it. They may have uh, tried to get rid of it. But you just get out another scroll. Take out your pen and rewrite everything that was written on that scroll and write so much more. You see, here's the danger that we're facing. And here's the warning that we've got to heed. And we find it in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, when it says this. After that generation, talking about Joshua's generation, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things He had done for Israel. How could that be possible? The only way that it was possible is that one generation failed to communicate it to the next generation. Somewhere down the line, it became unimportant. And I want you to notice what that generation ran to. The Bible says that they ran to the gods of Baal and the gods of Asherah. Now, you know a lot about these gods if you've studied Scripture, but let me just remind you. The god of Baal, among other things, he was known as the god of storms and rain, and he was sought to control vegetation and agriculture. The goddess Ashtoreth was the goddess of love and fertility. So they became a culture that was obsessed with material wealth and carnal pleasures. Hello? Yes. So let's ask another question. Could it be the reason this generation went after those idols is because they saw their moms and dads flirting with those very same idols? I've heard it said this way before, that what one generation walks in, the next generation will run in. Somewhere their relationship with God began to take a back seat. Time with God became an afterthought. A worship became a ritual rather than a relationship. And section by section, they cut away and burned off God's holy convictions and standards. They began to be more in step with their culture than they were in step with their God. And Galatians chapter 5 verse 25 says this. It says, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. It does not say, keep in step with the culture. It's a dangerous trend when a generation, especially in the church, becomes more in step with their culture than they are in step with the Holy Ghost. Here's why. Culture constantly changes, but Jesus and His Word never does change. In the context I'm talking of, the word culture, we're talking about a particular group of people in a particular kind of setting. Uh, we know that there are different cultures in, in, our, in our world. But you know, the definition of culture, one of its meanings can also mean to rot. You think about it. Culture buttermilk. Man, I like it in biscuits. I like it in ranch dressing. But I don't like to drink it out of glass like my granddad did. There's just something about it that gags me. I'm sorry. I just don't like it. But cultured buttermilk, in other words, it means something had to ferment and rot in that before you got to enjoy it. Cottage cheese. I like it in lasagna. You know, it's pretty good, but I don't like to just eat it right, right out, of the, out, out of the tub. I know some people that do. God bless you. There's, there's no offense in that. But something had to rot in that before you got to eat it. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It's just it's, it's the way it is. Well, how can you, you know, equate it with that? Because buttermilk is good, cottage cheese is good. I like to call it like this. I like to say it this way. Those things are rotting with style. <laughs> They're rotting with style. I want to tell you something. I believe our culture has been rotting with style for a very long time. I mean, where else can you find people dressed to the hill with tuxedos and evening deck gowns and walk a red carpet and be surrounded by all this beautiful opulence and handed gold statues and award themselves for some of the worst filth you'll ever see on a silver screen. I'm telling you, we've been rotting with style for a very long time now. Yeah. See, the natural progression of any culture away from God is, is actually to move and veer away from the principles of God. Watch the knee. He was a, a Chinese martyr. Yeah. He wrote the book called The Normal Christian Life. It's one of the greatest books I've ever read in my life. It'll shake you to your core. It really will. He talked about this in his book. And he said that the natural progression of any institution or culture is to, is to bend away from the Lord even if it starts there. If, if, that, if, if, if godly principle is not passed down, 
It'll just begin to naturally veer away. And he used the examples of Harvard, Yale, and Oxford universities. All of these started as institutions to train ministers to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of them started there. But look at them now. Somewhere down the line, all of these things were passed down. Godly principle wasn't passed down. Godly legacy wasn't passed down. See, passing down godly legacy and principle keeps a civilization from rotting from within. Yeah. Here's what Psalm 119 tells us in verse 93. It says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Can I remind us this morning? The Bible says that you and I are the salt of the earth. And one of the things that salt does is it's a preservative. And I tell you, if we don't become the preservative, we are going to leave this generation vulnerable to the spirit of this age. And I believe that the spirit of this age is the spirit of Jezebel. We are living in that age right now. Here's the thing about Jezebel. Let me just kind of break down what I believe this means. You know, the name Jezebel, it actually means to be chaste and to be pure. But when you look in Scripture, Jezebel was one of the most wicked people that there was. She was a manipulator. She was a murderer. She was threatening. She tried to eradicate everything that had to do with God. But her name meant pure. Her main name meant chaste. But see, that's what the Jezebel spirit is. It's to call that which is good evil and that which is evil good. And God warned us about that in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 when he said, What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. That light is dark and dark is, dark is light. That bitter is sweet and that sweet is bitter. But that is where we are right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of you may know this name. There's a guy out there right now. His name is Rob Bell. Some of you have heard of him. He's the founding pastor of Mars Hill Bible Church. He came out with a book several years ago that ruffled a lot of feathers where he came to the conclusion that uh, nobody was going to hell. <laughs> nobody. Uh, you know, God's just going to have mercy on everybody no matter who they were. I don't, care if it's, I don't care if it was Hitler. I don't care if it was Stalin. I don't care who it is. Nobody's going to hell. It's called Love Wins. And he ruffled a lot more feathers just a couple of years ago when he appeared on Oprah Winfrey's uh, show called Super Soul Sunday. And they were talking about the issue of same-sex marriage. And he said these words. He says that he believes that a church that does not support same-sex marriage will continue to become even more irrelevant. Here's what he said. And I quote. He said, I think culture is already there. Now, I would agree with him right there. Culture may be there. Yeah. Culture is there. But God's Word is not there. God's principles aren't there. God's conviction is not there. And it will never be there. Here's what he said. He said, I think culture is already there. And the church will continue to be even more irrelevant. Now listen to this. When it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense, in one sentence, he just cut away and burned the entire New Testament. Let me ask you something. Does that infuriate you? Does that uh, threaten you? Does that make you feel marginalized? Well, that's exactly what the Jezebel spirit does. It says, if you don't line up with me, we're going to chew you up and we're going to spit you out. If you don't believe like I do, you're a bigot. You're intolerant. You're irrelevant. You're marginalized. You see, Jezebel was tolerant of everything except one thing, and that was the truth. She says, may the gods do to me by, by what you did to my prophets by this time tomorrow if I don't have your head on a platter. Yes, sir. She wanted everything to be acceptable except the truth. Can I just say this today? God is calling you and me to be the salt of the earth because somebody has got to get out the pen of your testimony and run it across the ground. Barclay said, there are two great days in a person's life. The day we are born and the day we discover why. Let me remind you, you're born by God. You're born to be holy. You were born to worship. You were born to snatch souls from the jaws of hell. You were born to rewrite the soul and hold Jesus up and give it to the next generation. See, if we fail to rewrite 
rewrite the scroll, then culture will rewrite the scroll in its image. Thomas Jefferson, many of you know this, he was what was called a deist. And a deist believes that God created everything, but then he stepped back and let nature take its course, and he does not intervene in the affairs of man. So a deist doesn't believe in the miracles. A deist doesn't believe in God's intervention. So Thomas Jefferson had a problem when he would read the Bible because he would see all these accounts of God's intervention with man. Yeah. He'd see all of these miracles that took place. And so what he did is he notoriously cut and stitched together his own Bible. He took, he took a pair of scissors, cut out all of the miracles, cut out Jesus' resurrection, cut out most hints of anything supernatural, and it's called the Jefferson Bible. And I love what one blogger on PluggedIn.com online said. She said these words, and I love this. She said, throughout the culture, we see a desire to take our own societal scissors to the book and turn it into something more palatable for the 21st century. Second abundance often say that Christianity must change with the times and if it hopes to stay relevant. But Christianity has remained relevant precisely because of its stubborn adherence to the eternal. Lots of people don't get that. Sometimes we Christians don't get that. But to be a Christian is to be out of step with the world at times. That's a hard thing, but it's what we must do. And to do anything else, to massage God's Word, to better fit our inclinations, ushers us into a spot where we play God. In the beginning was the Word, we're told in John 1.1, 1, 1, but changing that Word to fit our old image, well, that's a problem. Let me ask you, when you feel threatened, many times our instinct is to do exactly what Elijah did when Jezebel threatened him. And that's to shrink back into a cave. I go, you know what? I don't know that I want to rock the boat. I don't know that I want to be out of step with culture. I don't know that I want to stick out and, and, and have my and have have a, a sword swung in my head. I don't know that I want to want to step out into the arena and, 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 and be a target for so many arrows. Many times our instinct is like Elijah when he shrunk into that cave and just for a moment just had a had a crisis of faith in his own life. And I believe that God would say to us in those same situations the same thing he said to Elijah. He came to Elijah lovingly. He said, listen, I know you're having a hard time right now, but what are you doing here? Yeah. Why are you here in this cave? Mm. And you remember what happened in that account? Elijah said, here, I want you to do something. I want you to come and stand out because I'm about to show you a few things. And we remember what happened. The Bible says that there came this crazy fire that came across his path, but God wasn't in the fire. It says there came an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. There came a strong wind that ripped the rocks off the mountain, but God was not in that wind. But then he heard, you know the story, he heard a whisper. And Elijah heard it. And it was the beginning of something that stirred up in his soul again. It was the beginning of, a, of something that, that brought new life and he went out and began to fulfill his destiny. But here's the thing I saw in all of that. You know, God shows us that the winds of political change are not going to be the answer. I mean, the, the answer is not going to be in the shakeup of government legislation. Oh, we need to respect government, and, and, and I know that God honors that. And it's not going to come in a fiery war of armies on a battlefield. But change comes when we put ourselves in a position to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us and act on it and speak it and be unmovable in it. You see, church, let me, let me just say, to say this this morning. Don't underestimate the simple preaching and witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its power to preserve a godly legacy in this rotting culture. Don't underestimate the power of your story. Yes. Don't underestimate the power of your simple testimony. Changes are going to come by some big radical thing. No, no, no. It comes. Jesus said, he said, it's, it's, it's like the mustard seed. He says it's one reaching one. One reaching the other, then two reaching two, then three reaching three, six reaching twelve, and it grows and it germinates. Yes. Don't underestimate the power of your story to rewrite the scroll in this generation. I met a young lady not long ago in Decatur, Alabama. She uh, was a senior in high school, and she wrote for her 
uh, school newspaper. And the way that she would use it is she just used this opportunity, uh, this, this platform to just share her faith all the time. That's, that's, the way, that's what she did with it. And in this one particular article, she wrote an article called My Choice in Faith is the Best Choice I've Made. It's right here. And in this article, it's, it's with the Austin Accent, a student newspaper at their school. She just gives a simple testimony about what Jesus means to her. I mean, it's not a big theological dissertation. I mean, it's just a very simple presentation. And this is a part of it here. Just listen to this. She says, we believe that Christ died on the cross as a payment for our own sins and rose again. Our sin debt is paid and we're forgiven. Jesus did it all when he hanged on that cross. Even if we didn't deserve it, he still did it. He loves us so much. God's mercies are new every morning. God created us in His image. He knows more about how we can be happy than we do. Yeah. I want to ask you something. Do you think that make, make, would make a difference? Do you think something that simple could make a change? But you tell me. Next day she got this text message on her phone right here. It says this. It says, hi. So you probably don't notice me at school, but we go to the same school. And well, I always buy the Austin newspaper. And the one you wrote about religion and how it was the best choice you ever made when you accepted God. Well, I literally cried because it impacted me a lot. And I'm an atheist. <laughs> but it's weird how I felt in that moment. Thank you, because it was an encouragement for me. That's all I wanted to tell you. Sorry if I bothered you. I want to tell you something. It's so amazing to me that this atheist, she doesn't even understand what, what it is she's feeling. But she, she, you and I understand. It was the Holy Spirit of God writing on the Word of God. And this young lady now is being stirred and dealt with and impacted because one teenager decides to rewrite the scroll and hold it up for her generation to see. One young lady had it written out of her life. One young lady had it burned out of her life. But thank God, through the simple testimony of one teenager, she stood up and took So the Bible says that 
Rehoboam gathered all of the, the advisors that were older, the, of the elder advisors to him, and asked them the question, hey, this has been presented to me, what do you think? And they said, oh, listen, we think that's a great idea. What better way to gain favor with the people and have their hearts turn to support you and love you and see this kingdom grow again? And then Scripture says he got the younger advisors together. And he asked them the same question. What should I do about it, guys? And this is what they said. They said, huh. he said, you go and tell those people, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. And the Bible says that that is exactly the advice that Rehoboam took. That's exactly what he told the people. My father is... They laid heavy burdens on you, but what I'm about to do to you is not even compared. He beat you with whips, but I'm going to beat you with scorpions. And so the word was given, the decree was made, the bottom fell out. Can you imagine the people of God in that day? What happened? God, where are you? This is not going good. This, this is a dark turn. We prayed. We believed you. Have you ever been there? But I tell you, it's so crazy because even in the darkest moments, God never fails to give the glimmer of hope. Yeah, that's right. Listen to what it says in the verse right after this. It says, the king paid no attention to the people, but this turn of events was the will of the Lord for it fulfilled the Lord's message. Well, Darren, how in the world can what be happening today fulfill the Lord's word? What word? Is he fulfilling? Well, let me give you a clue. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. In the last days, there's going to be difficult times. People are going to love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred, not even marriage, by the way. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others, have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasure rather than love God. They will act religious. They'll fail. God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ where they spew out all their curses but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. The Bible also says flip one more page. It says they're going to come to a place where they're no longer going to listen to wholesome teaching. They'll follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truth and chase after me. I want to tell you whether we have a victory or whether it just keeps getting darker, they from the lion's mouth. Only two leg bones or a piece of an ear. So will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued. You know, of course, we all know about shepherds and sheep. We know that a shepherd, it's his duty to guard the sheep. And a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus taught us that. Yeah. And even though he's guarding the sheep and doing the best he can, inevitably, there will at some time, at one point or another, a predator will break through the ranks and will get a sheep. It's going to happen. But when it happens, the shepherd just doesn't look over and shrug his shoulders. He goes over and takes his staff and he, man, he wedges in between the two and he fights for that sheep. Even if that sheep is already ripped apart, he fights to get it out of his mouth to do everything he can to rescue it. Because here's, here's where the scripture comes into play. After the predator is gone, after he, after he drives it away and the sheep is lost, what he does is he takes a piece of an ear. He takes a couple of leg bones and he goes back to the master of the sheep, the ones that own the sheep, and he comes up to the master and he, he's got blood on his clothes and he says, hey, we lost one today. But I want you to look at me. I've got blood on my clothes. Here's two leg bones. Here's a piece of an ear. I didn't let it go without a fight. 
I didn't let him go without doing my best to tell him about the life that he could have. You see, I believe that when we stand before God, I believe that's what our posture has to be. God, here's a tooth, here's an ear. I didn't let him go without a fight. I held the line, I spoke the truth, I ran the race, I finished the course. When my culture cut away and burned God's word, when they went to hell, I did my best to rewrite the scroll with my life and hold it up to this generation. We can't quit or be silent because the culture is more hostile to the gospel now. Right. Right. We can't wait for perfect conditions because they're never going to come. Right. Right. It's like that, that, that story about this guy that was walking down the, down the street or down the sidewalk <coughs> in this town. And there was this big wooden fence, you know, it was pretty high. And he heard this guy on the other side of the fence. He's shouting, he's going, Yay, 44! Yay, 44! 44! It's like, what's that all about, you know? And he's, there's this knot hole in the fence, you know, this hole, and he, he peeks through it and looks, and the guy on the other side takes a stick and pokes the guy in the eye and goes, 45! Yes! 45! Yes! <laughs> so, people will, oh, there, there will always be people who will live to hurt you. <laughs> there are always going to be people, I like the way T.D. Jake says it, they are annoyed to hate you. <laughs> See, there's never going to be a perfect time. There's never going to be a perfect condition. Whether it's light, whether it's dark, in season, in out of season, somebody has to stand up and rewrite the scroll that has been burned away and cut away. Somebody has got to stand up and hold it up for this generation to stand yes, up again. Yes. Did not the Apostle Paul say, we are living epistles. Yeah. We're living epistles. It means that when they can't read it here, they can read it right here. When they can't see it here, they can see it right here. When they can't hear it here, they can hear it right here. You and I are the rewritten scroll of the Word of God shouting out to this generation. Somebody's got to rewrite the scroll. Somebody's got to hold it up. Somebody's got to have the posture. Here's the tooth, God. Here's an ear. If they went to hell, it wasn't because I didn't stand in between them and try to stop them. Benjamin Franklin said, He that would give up a little liberty for security deserves neither and loses both. Mm. Mm. You know, I know we're living in some pretty crazy times right now. <coughs> now. We go back to that story where Jesus is in the boat in the storm and he's sleeping. You remember that story? Jesus wasn't asleep in the storm because he was uncaring. And the disciples charged him with that. You know, they woke him up. Jesus, we're about to die. Don't you care? <laughs> yeah. And I tell you, that, that's, that's a lot of what I've heard different people in the church, you know, wondering, God, does God even care anymore? He's not asleep because he didn't care. He was sleeping because he wasn't intimidated. <laughs> he was at peace. And just said, yeah, it's stormy, but I, it's not going to scare me. Yeah. Come on. You can, there's, thank God there's still rest in the storm. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a rest in the darkness. There's still a rest in a season like this. And because Jesus wasn't intimidated, it means that we don't have to be intimidated. You know what I found? This is completely off script. I'm going off the rails right here. I found it, but this is free. And this is just, just it's, it's, it's no big revelation, but it's just encouragement. I found that whenever I'm scared to witness to somebody or walk up to somebody, tell them about the Lord, do it scared. Because I find out that when you do it scared, the minute you open your mouth, fear leaves. Wow. It does. It leaves. Every time. So that's free. Take that. Put it there. Then finally, in Micah chapter 4, verse 9. Babylon finally has come. Jeremiah rewrote the scroll. Jeremiah held it up. And then God gives this word for the prophet Micah. Babylon has come. Israel is being hauled away. And here's what he tells them. This is in the message version. I love the way it puts it. So why the doomsday hysterics? You have a king, don't you? But maybe he's not doing his job and you're panicked like a woman in labor. Well, go ahead. Twist and scream, daughter Jerusalem. You're like a woman in childbirth. Soon you'll be out of the city, on your way, camping in the open country. And then you'll arrive in Babylon. 
But here again, God always plants the seed of hope in the middle of despair. What you lost in Jerusalem will be found in Babylon. God will give you new life again. He'll redeem you from your enemies. Listen, we all know that in the end it's going to be all right. Yeah. We all know that when it all comes down to it, Jesus is going to win. We all know that when He comes back, everything's going to be set in order. But the next paragraph is where we live right now. But for right now, yeah. they're ganged up against you. Right. Many godless people say, kick her while she's down. Violate her. We want to see Zion grovel in the dirt. And I want to tell you, if there was ever a prophetic description of the way the world is treating the church right now. That's it. Right. There is the, the respect is gone. Grovel in the dirt. Kick her while she's down. Let's do everything we can to mock and ridicule and blaspheme and make these people look like idiots. That's where we are. Kick her while she's down. And again, we're tempted to get in the cave. Again, we're tempted to go, God, what's going on? But here again, in the same scripture, God gives the hope. These blasphemers have no idea what God is thinking and doing in this. They don't know that this is the making of God's people. Yeah. <laughs> they are wheat being threshed and gold being refined. Listen, if there's anything you learn about God in Scripture, it's this. God works in the paradoxes. In the life of Joseph, a prisoner becomes a prince. In the life of David, a weak little boy becomes a strong king. In the life of Gideon, someone timid becomes someone bold. In the life of Rahab, an unclean prostitute becomes pure and part of the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. You learn the life of Paul. In my weakness, God shows off his strength. Can I just say this and I'm not prophet, but I believe I'll speak prophetically. I believe that because in the same way that the Jeremiah's and the Isaiah's and the Daniel's showed up in Israel's darkest moments, I believe that God's greatest prophetic voices are going to show up in this dark moment too. I believe that God is not just calling the evangelists and the pastors, but He's calling We have a legacy. It was about three years ago. I was at uh, the 100th anniversary of the Alabama District Council and the Assemblies of God. And in that meeting, they gave all the ministers this big, nice book of stories of missionaries that have been on the field all through the decades and how God moved and what God did through their lives. And there was one such story just stood out to me. And I want to share this with you. I'm just about to close, okay? But you know that when the evangelist says that, that means it's he, he, like an airplane. He's on a whole pattern. You go around a few more times, but he's getting ready. He's getting ready. The story's about a pastor named Boone Song. He was traveling down the road in South Thailand. All day long, Boone Song had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in the villages along the way, but his message received little Almost no response. As he passed into her house, a woman came out and offered him a drink, and he accepted it gratefully, wiping his brow. And with only a few minutes, Boone's song of drinking that drink, with only a few minutes, he became deathly ill. By the time he arrived home, he was losing consciousness, and too late he realized that the drink that he'd so quickly received had been poisoned. At the nearest hospital, doctors began to treat the now unconscious, unconscious pastor. Blood was pouring from Boone Song's nose. His throat was closed. His lips were badly swollen. His death appeared all but certain. <coughs> Boone Song's wife, however, was praying earnestly for him, and she claimed the promise of Mark chapter 16, verse 18, where it says, If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And true to God's word, God performed a miracle, and Boone Song regained consciousness, and his condition stabilized, and in only a few days he was out preaching the gospel again. Boonsong went back to the village where he had been poisoned. <coughs> I'll just say something right here. I think it'd be the last thing. <laughs> but I heard a missionary this past week of the district council talk about the principle of capacity. That when we have Christ, 
there, there is, he creates in us a capacity to do things that we would not ordinarily be able to do. Yes. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. And this man went back to the village. And the people gathered around him, including the woman who had given him the deadly drink. Wow. You should be dead, the woman cried out. Wow. And people listened as the woman told what she had done. She admitted it. Since Boonsong was obviously alive and well, they were anxious to hear his story. And when Boonsong told them about a God more powerful than poison, almost the entire village accepted Christ as Savior. Yeah. During the next 18 months, Boonsong established a strong church. But his miracle wasn't the only one to take place in that village. Mr. Noy, he was a new believer. He was out plowing a field one day when he was bit by a poisonous snake. Almost immediately, his leg began to swell. And hurrying to his house, he called to his wife to bring him their Bible. And frantically, he searched for Mark 16, 18. The verse that Boonsong had quoted so many times. He said, that verse that saved Boonsong from death, it's my only hope, he told his wife. He said, I've got to find it. And in desperation, Mr. Noy placed the whole Bible over the snake bite and prayed. He said, oh God, I can't find that verse anywhere. He said, I know it's there somewhere, and since this is your book, you must know where it is. You find that verse, Lord, and you make it work for me like it did for Moonsong. Ah! So Mr. Noah and his wife, they waited a few minutes, and then they lifted the Bible off the snake bite, and the page of the Bible next to Mr. Noah's skin was completely soaking wet with that poison. He said, look at that wet spot. He said, the poison has come out. Mr. Noah recovered completely from the snake bite, and in the village, Mark 16, 18, has become known as the no herb promise. Let me say it again, folks. We've got to take the pen of our testimony right across the canvas of our life. You know, I hope you'll join me in just having the posture that if my culture tries to blot out the scroll, we're just going to rewrite it. If they try to smear it out, we're going to rewrite it. If they try to cut it out, we're going to rewrite it. If they try to burn it out, we are going to rewrite this scroll with our life. Woo. Let me just say this. We are hardwired with a conscience toward godly truth. Every human being is hardwired that way. And the Bible says that we can sear our conscience. Mm -hmm. yes. Like with a hot iron. You know, yeah. if you get burned by it bad enough, you lose your feeling in that part of which you burn. And exactly. you, you sear your conscience, yeah. you lose the feeling of conviction. But we're hardwired with a conscience toward godly truth. And it's funny how it comes out in the weirdest places. Fashion designers Dolce & Gabbana, some of you are familiar with, with, those, uh, with that brand. Dolce & Gabbana, it's two men. Uh, they were once a, a gay couple, and they are homosexual men. They were once a gay couple, but they're not now. When all of this was coming down with, with the gay marriage in 2015, they rattled some cages with, with what they had to say about it. Of course, everybody, I mean, if you were living in the gay lifestyle, you supported same-sex marriage, but this is what they said, and I quote, they said, the only family is the traditional one. Life has a natural flow, and there are some things that should not be changed. You see, that conscience is in there. To godly truth, it's in there. Our call is to wake it up. Some people will love it. Some people will hate it. George Orwell the man who wrote the book 1984, a lot of you know that. He made the statement, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. We're there. Yeah. Yes, sir. But it doesn't matter. Things may be dark, but it doesn't matter. Jeremiah, you are that generation. Rewrite the scroll. Jeremiah was the one that said, God, I, I can't do this. He said, don't, don't say that, Jeremiah. You know, how many of us have sat in this room and said, you know what, God, I, this is too big for me. I, I, can't, I can't bear a weight like this. No, 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 listen. You do what God tells you to do. In your work, in your school, the one person that God tells you to reach, yes, you can. See, the Jeremiah, see, Jeremiah came from, from humble beginnings. He, he didn't come from a big lineage of ministers or prophets or kings. No, 
He was a common man. See, the Jeremiah generation is the generation of somebody that didn't come from any kind of big background or illustrious dignitaries or anything like that. It's just the common folks. God is raising up the common folks. Us, you, me, to rewrite the story for this generation. That's what's going to come. Last night, we had a tragedy happen in our city, um, in our town, in Florence, um, Thursday. My, my, kid, my, my children go to Wilson High School, and uh, my, two, my two kids, they're, they're both uh, juniors. There were three young men, two of them were 16, one of them was 17, riding in a car with two other girls, and uh, they had a one-car accident. And all three of those young men lost their lives in that accident. Uh, the other two were in intensive care. The girl that was driving, it was revealed that there was alcohol involved. They don't know the extent. Uh, but I tell you, last night I attended a, and spoke at a uh, candlelight vigil at the football stadium. Uh, it was just one, one of the, there were several of the youth ministers there. Several students spoke, and I was just <coughs> in the line of several. It's so crazy because. You know, We've heard this example. We've heard this example all our life, but to see it happen, it just brings new life to it. Is there are 700 people in those stands, and they're lighting their candles. Each one, when they light their candle, at the time they're all lit, it just changes the atmosphere. And we saw. I don't want to tell you something. In that moment, everything pointed to Jesus. Every word that came out of everybody's mouth was pointing to Jesus. About how He's the hope. He's the strength. He's the peace. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. But the thing that just really got me is that when the prober part of it was over, I watched 250 kids. Nobody prodded them. Nobody coerced them. It was like second nature to them. They got out of the bleachers. They all walked out into the center of that football field. Hauled up a big mass. You know what they did? They prayed wow. in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> right there in that moment, I want to tell you, 250 kids rewrote the scroll. Come on. And remembered what was important. They remembered who the answer is. Yeah. They remembered... Who is their peace? Right. And remember who their strength is. Yes. And I watched, I watched grown big football players hug each other and weep and tell each other, I love you. I love you. I love you. You don't ever see just grown, you know, rough teenagers at football. They have got to be have a tough masculine exterior. You don't ever just see them do that. I want to tell you, <coughs> something like this happens. Yeah. It brings it out. In that moment, they were rewriting the scroll for their student life. Today, I believe that what will be appropriate we find a place at this altar. And we just say, God, I want you to ignite the flame in me fresh. I'm a living epistle. I accept my call as that. And however simple of a way, God, you want me to, whether it's giving a word of encouragement, writing somebody a letter, making a phone call, whatever it is, Father, show me how to rewrite the scroll in the world in which I live. You matter. What we do matters. How we rewrite the scroll where we live matters. And here's the thing about it. We must do it. Yes. We must do it. Jezebel is breathing down our necks. Right. The only thing that destroyed Jezebel was the truth. Right. That's why she hated it so much. Yes. It was the truth. Let her rage, let her scream, let her yell, let her breathe her threats. But at the end of the day, 
She's falling from a tower right. and dogs are licking her up and eating right. her flesh. Right. It's the word of God that does that. Yeah. Why don't you stand up with me? Before we leave this auditorium this morning, can we do that? I want you to come. Come on, let's find us a spot up here. Everybody that came will, God, come on. Ignite my friend fresh. Lord, cause me to walk as the living epistle would call me to be. Father, baptize me fresh in the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost. I need strength. I need boldness. Lord, I've been afraid to do some things. Folks, can I tell you something? I have too. I've been afraid to do some things. But God, it's not wrong to be afraid. It's wrong to let it control you. Hey, can I tell you this? Listen, can I tell you this? It's okay to be afraid. Right. It's all right to, to experience the emotion of fear. The trick is, we don't let it dictate us. Do it scared. I heard a friend of mine say this one time, and it's never left my brain. Sometimes all it takes is 30 seconds of insane courage. 30 seconds of insane courage. 30 seconds. Rewrite the scroll. Rewrite the scroll. If you're here this morning and you know, and I always make this clear, no matter where I go, no matter what I preach. If you're here today and you know that you need to get some things right to Jesus today. If things are not right with the Lord and you know that they need to be, God loves you. Yeah. And He's here to make things right with you. And you're here today and you can say, God, that's me. I know that I need to either give my life to the Lord or I need to make a recommitment of my life to Him. God has lovingly continued to me about some things. And I know that I need to make a fresh start. Just shut your eyes with me. And if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand and say, God, that's me. I see you. Hands. My hands. Pray this with me right now. Say, just say it after me. And I know that you mean it. Um, you will. God's going to give you a fresh start this morning. Say this with me like this. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I know you died for me. And I know you rose again for me. I know you're the Son of God. Come into my life fresh. I give you my heart fresh. I am yours. And I thank you for a fresh start now. In the name of Jesus. But Lord, I thank you that everybody that prayed that prayer that needed to, they got a fresh start. Everything is covered by the blood of Jesus. They are living epistles. They have the Spirit of God inside of them. They have the anointing inside of them. They have been made confident as ministers of this new covenant. And they have a destiny to walk into. And I thank you, God, that they're going to be able to fulfill it because you gave them the power to me. In the name of Jesus right now, thank you, God, for doing it.